Episode 52. Hello, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff, and I'll be your host as we listen to eyewitness encounters involving one of the most terrifying cryptids, Dogmen. Our guest tonight is Billy. Billy, welcome to Dogman Encounters Radio. Thanks so much for coming. Thanks for having me, Vic. Please give us a brief bio. Well, I grew up in the South. I uh, spent the majority of my life in the South. South Mississippi, be exact, on the coast. I'm married, had three kids. And after Hurricane Katrina mucked through us down here, we decided to back up and move north to Wyoming. Uh, we spent about, I don't know, eight or nine years there. And some issues come along, which forced us back down south. Uh, we've been here for the last few years. Uh, decided that the heat's kind of too much. So we're, uh, Everything's better. I think we're going to decide to go up, uh, back up, move back up. Uh, I'm very outdoorsy guy. Anything to do outdoors, uh, I, I don't stay inside very much. Um, I try to teach my kids the same. That's orient them. There's so many things are technology driven now anymore. Everybody's inside. So we're, we're pretty outside family, uh, camping, fishing, you name it. Um, other than that, I'm just a simple guy. There's not really too much to know. As a kid, did you have any fascination with cryptids like Bigfoot, werewolves, etc.? Uh, I can't remember any. Um, I was, like I said, an out, out, outdoorsy guy I was growing up. Little kid, daylight hit, I hit the door, and uh, at dark, my parents had to make me come in. Uh, I was you know, whatever I can get in out there, I, I can't remember a time where I was really into into that kind of stuff. TV wasn't my thing, so I didn't didn't keep up with any stuff like that. So I can't say that I was. I wasn't into any of that. If you had been into Bigfoot and other cryptids like that from an early age, I guess it would be easy for a listener to claim that you had Bigfoot or Dogman on the brain, and that's why you quote unquote thought you saw one. But since you never were like that. That throws that idea right out the window. Moving on, now that you've had your encounter, what's been the hardest lingering effect to deal with? Well, I don't look at the wood the same. I'd say you um, you don't just look at the wood as the wood and ooh, that looks like a nice place to go fishing, or ooh, that looks like a nice place to go hunting, or hey, you know, oh, I might take the family over here this weekend, or we, you know, I, I move around a lot with uh, my job, so. I get to see a lot, a lot of country. I mean, I've seen a lot of country. And um, it's, now it's, you look at it and say, well, I wonder if there's anything like that dangerous in that area. Oh, well, it looks like that may be something bad in that area. Or, you know, maybe I should look up and see if there's been any sightings or issues with that kind of thing in this area. I mean, that that's, I went from a careless, carefree guy Take the family hike and let's go to the woods, to the lake, to the river, to the beach, whatever. And now there's there's that in my mind now. There's a worry of, you know, what would I do if that happens when I got my family with me now? Well, you know, I'm, I'm I'm I got my head, my eyes, my ears open on that kind of stuff. Now it's 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 hard not to just just relax when you're out there now. Oh, I can understand that. I can't see how anyone could blame you for feeling that way. You know, in the pre-interview, you mentioned the fact that your job requires you to go into the woods, deep into areas where people don't normally go. I can only imagine the effect your encounter has had on your ability to do that job. Oh, yes, sir. That's, uh, um, I, I, I'm on call 24-7, and, you know, I get called out any time. And most of the time when there's a problem, it's going to happen, you know, late, late at night when everybody's in bed. And I get sent out way in the middle of a swamp or uh, to the woods or somewhere way away. And then every little pop and crick behind you, you know, around you, you that's in your head. It's, you get more concentrated. And next thing you know, you find yourself more concentrating and just trying to figure out what's going on out there than your job. 
Oh, I can imagine. After an encounter, it's bad enough when a person has to go out and take the trash out or go out to the car after dark, but having to head into a swamp after dark or heading way out into the middle of nowhere in the woods even, all by yourself, that would just be horrible. So I feel for you. Oh, yeah, and that's another thing I take uh, when, you know, I talk from travel around sometimes and I talk to my family at night, my wife, and, you know, and telling them when they take the trash out at night or whatever they got to do, you know, I'm always worried. Be careful. Please pay attention. Please watch around you. And now, since all that, my wife's become very familiar with gun. My kids have too. And now I make sure that she carries that thing when it calls for it. And when she's able to, I'm always asking you make sure you got your gun. You got it where you can get to it. Is it loaded? Is it safe away from the kids now? You know, so that's a whole other subject now you got to put in there to worry about is a, is a gun now when you burn your family. So, um, you know, it, it, it changes your life in a big way. Oh, sure it does. Yeah, when you have an encounter like that, it really does complicate things as if life isn't complicated enough on its own. You talked a little bit with me about the whole dynamic of sharing the encounter with your wife and your kids. Your kids aren't all that much past the age when you were up to your neck with work trying to convince them that they didn't have a monster under their bed. What was it like having to reverse that now and tell your kids about that encounter that you had with what, for lack of a better term, could be called a monster? Well, that took a, a long, long talk with my wife. Like I was saying, I had nightmares for the longest time, and they would just, like, regular nightmare, just wake up and know the jerk. No, it was it was rough uh, uh, where I was loud, and it woke my son up. And he's very, very, you know, observing. He, he, he watches everything that goes on. And he knew something was up. He seen my arm, and he seen what I was going through, and it, 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 it was eating on him bad and bugging me. So, and when we'd go places, I would have to stay on him about watch this or watch that. Don't go over there. Stay over here where I can see you. Make sure I can see what you're doing. And eventually, you know, they just drill into me, Dad, what's going on? You know, kind of thing. So, me and my wife got together one night and we set them all down and told them what was happening, what's going on. And I didn't know what to expect from them. I really didn't. But it was like they just couldn't take it in. There was just silence. There was, you know, a, well, I'm sorry, Dad, and a, a hug and whatever. And just you can tell that they just didn't know how to take it. They just didn't just didn't know what to do with it. And, and so, but now they're they're more conscious to the thing now that when we do go somewhere, it's on their mind now. And I didn't want to ruin their time, but I just want to make them aware of there's there is stuff like that out there, and you you do need to pay attention and don't listen to what the outside tells you, you know, who cares if they laugh, but whatever, it's true, it's, it's real. You just need to protect yourself, but they took it well. I mean, it's it's gone good. They don't bring it up. They don't bug me about it. They they know what it is, it is what it is, and that's just the way it is. Other than that encounter that you had with that dog man, have you had any other close calls out in the wilderness? Uh. Nothing like that. I've been stranded in the woods before. <laughs> like I said, I've spent a lot of time. The majority of my life, especially growing up, is, was in the woods. But I've, I've been stranded. I'm telling you about that I got trapped in the, three days in the river in the swamp with nothing but a dog and a boat and a rope that I had to tow up river. That's my only other thing that I ever had happen to me but nothing like the dog man. I think you said you had a Doberman that you used to take camping with you, and that's who was stranded with you that time. Yes, sir, it was a Doberman. It, uh, see, I, I had friends, not very many. A few that I had, either their mom was, uh, you know, didn't like them going out in the woods or that far away or fishing or, you know, or they didn't like doing it. So I was either by myself or, you know, my dog. I had a Durbin, Durbin Fincher at the time. And I've always, I always went to the river weekends. 
But I moved out on my 16th birthday. 16th birthday, I bought a little place and had the dog. And people knew that I was always been the kind of guy that just I just up and go, go camping for a little while for a few days or whatever. I was bad about not telling nobody where I went or things like that. So uh, I was working on a boat and I was going to test drive it. I took it to the river and I never go down river, never. I never go down river. And that day I wanted to go check out a Pacific place that was up river because I was wanting to go fishing there the next day or the weekend. So, you know, I was like, you know what? I told my dog, you know, what? Well, you know, let's just go ahead. It'll be all right. We'll go on down. So we headed down river, and uh, the reason why I always go up river is because in case something happened, I can always just float down. So we went down river that day to check out a spot, and we did. We went down. It was ways down there, and then you had to cut off into the swamp. And I went into the swamp a ways, and then there was a bad, uh, real sharp bend that curved back off the main branch into a spot, and then that bend the current was really bad. So I pulled in that little bend, ended up having a problem with my boat. My shear pin broke and my propeller, and I put in gear, and nothing would happen. So it's kind of screwed. I didn't have no anything to fix it. So I had to tie the boat to my waist and uh, jump out into the water. And it was it's it's pretty snake infested, uh, deer infested area. Um, so I had to swim. Wade pulled myself through trees, swamp, while I pulled that boat with that dog. And when it started getting dark, I'd find a little dry area, sandy area, whatever I could climb onto. And we had uh, flip the boat over on top of us and spend the night. But as long as he was fine and didn't growl, bark, gears perk up, whatever, I was fine. You know, it didn't ever, um, I'd never, I, you know, I spent times like that out there by myself at night and nothing. Nothing ever spooked me. Nothing ever happened. Uh, nothing ever bothered him. So, you know, I, I didn't think nothing out there it was just like that. I, and there I am, a kid running around, you know, in the dark, in the woods, in the swamp, and the, the people would be scared to death to go into, you know, and it didn't bother me because I didn't think nothing was there. Nothing that you didn't already know of. So when I seen that, that night, that dog went, that changed my world. Being stranded in the woods would be bad enough, but being stranded in a swamp like that, that really takes it over the top. Billy, let's get right into your encounter. Please tell us every last detail about that encounter that comes to mind. I want you to start off with the events that led to you being at that location where you had it, and then I want you to end with the first person that you told about that encounter after you got back to safety. Okay. I was in Wyoming. I lived in the very south part of Wyoming on the border there with Utah. And uh, I had to go to a training session for work in Bozeman, Montana. So I went up there and I spent a few days. And it was May of 2010. I remember this exactly because usually that's wrapping up the end of wintertime in that area. And that year, Specifically, May, we was having some pretty heavy snowstorms. But anyway, uh, I left from uh, Bozeman, uh, Bozeman, Montana, heading back home down south Wyoming. And uh, the snow started picking up, and it was getting heavier and heavier and heavier. I ended up messing up on my route, and I ended up heading right into Yellowstone National Park. And the roads were close to there. Uh, at that time of the year. So I ended up having to go find my way around this other route, and I ended up on this road. I'm pretty sure it's called uh, Teton Pass. I tried a uh, Google map in it the other day after I spoke with you, and, uh, and I'm pretty sure it was, it was Teton Pass, Highway 33 or something like that. Anyway, it was a big pass, a big mountain pass that crosses from Idaho over into Wyoming. And I wasn't sure if I was in uh, the Wyoming side or the Idaho side, but the snow was getting really heavy. And I got on this big mountain pass, and I had a bunch of switchbacks or cutbacks where you go back and forth going up and then, you know, back and forth or around going down. 
and uh, I can remember hearing on the radio the alert come on that the pass was closing, and I could see the flashing yellow lights on the sign that they put to close the road behind me when I was going up the mountain. So I was like, wow, I'm the last guy on this pass on this road. If everybody else, you know, is off the way on, I'm the only one on this stretch of road or this pass. So anyway, I made it to the top, and I remember it was it was getting so bad, the roads were so slick, I didn't get to the point where I didn't took my seatbelt off and opened my door of my truck, not all the way open, but I cracked the door because I was waiting for myself to slide off that mountain or off that pass. I was no worry pretty much about sliding off there. Anyway, um, I just started down maybe three turns going down, and I, I'm saying three turns, I'm not exactly sure, but it was about that long. I seen a, a whole big bunch of big horn sheep. I believe that's what they call them, big horn sheep. I'm from the south, I'm not too familiar with the, you know, the, if the, if the big horn sheep or the mountain goats, one or the other. I'm pretty sure it's a big horn sheep. Anyway, there was a bunch of them and they was, they was actually pushing into each other. They was ramming their chest and necks into each other, like trying to push each other out of the way, like, get out of my way. I need to go. Move, move, move. And like, they was, they was scared to death. You could see it in their eyes. Their eyes were wide open. They was heading up the mountain. I was going down. They was coming up. And I was like, whoa, that's, that's cool. I've never, I've never seen one of them in real life. And I know they're pretty rare to people hunt them down to, you know, climb up mountains, do a lot of hiking and a lot of time just to hunt one of these things down. And now I see a whole herd of them, a whole bunch of them. I was like, wow, that's cool. And I, I remember it's just getting dark. It's just getting dark, but. If you know anything about snow and at nighttime, if there's any kind of anything light, that snow lights everything up pretty bright. So, but it was just getting dark, and I tried to get a picture of them, and I, I couldn't already make it out. I mean, I just could see the rear end of one of them, so that sucks. But anyway, I made another pass or two coming down, and there was another set of them. I mean, they was moving. They was coming up that mountain fast, and they was... I mean, it, I remember coming up on them and I was trying to stop and I wasn't going very fast and I was sliding and I was like, oh crap, I'm going to hit them, I'm going to hit them because they ain't stop. they ain't worried about me. They worried about getting the heck out of somewhere. They was moving. They was going. Anyway, there was something else I've seen that night that I meant to share with you that I, I kind of put the pieces together later about what I think it could have been, but I seen a baby deer. He was young and a little, little, and he was set spots all over him. And he was out there by the road, and he was looking around. I was looking for Mama. Here. She was nowhere around. I was like, wow, well, well, you know, that's odd to see a, a baby deer by itself. That young, you know, looking around. I wouldn't say he had spots on him, but he was young. He was, I don't know if he was a orphaned or if he was a, a runt or what, but he was a little bitty deer. And uh, he may have been, didn't need a mom or whatever, but. Anyway, I don't even know what time they even born up there anyway. I come on down and I ran into a car. There was a car on the side of the road and I remember thinking, Wow, I'd hate to be stuck up here, broke down. And well, you know, I think I was thinking, Well, you know, I'm gonna check this car out and see if maybe I can get their license plates. Maybe if they're if they're local, I'm sure somebody else can help them quicker than I can if they get a cell phone and you know, I couldn't do much for them. But out of town, I want somebody to help me out with a place like this is being stuck out of town. So I'm going to stop, you know. I remember stopping up to the other side of them, and I couldn't see their tag. It was packed with snow. It was packed all over it. And uh, I looked in the window, and there was nobody in the car. So uh, I continued on. Well, a little ways on down the road, I noticed there was a big black mass on the right side of the road. And uh, it looked like maybe there was a really large person in a big coat in a ball. But it was really big, and I, I, I just couldn't place what it would be. And, and I was, I remember worrying, thinking, you know, maybe the owner of that car had gotten out and tried walking down the mountain, and the cold got them, or... Uh, they slipped in the road, maybe somebody hit them, or somebody slid into them and hit them, and, and they 
kept going and got scared, you know, all that stuff's going through your mind because there wasn't no snow on this black thing. You know, it, the snow was coming down hard. It was sticking everywhere and it was, you know, it was odd. So I was like, well, you know, it, it, may, it could be a person. Uh, snow's not sticking. Maybe, you know, body heat, whatever. Maybe it's more than one person and they bought up under, you know, a blanket or something. I like it. That stuff's going through your head. You just can't quite see good. It, it's snowing pretty hard. And it's blowing. Well, I pulled up behind it fairly close, but not that close. And I opened my door. I got out, and the wind was blowing, and it was, you could hear the wind whipping through the trees. Um, and the snow was so bad, it was sticking my eyelashes where I was trying to keep it out of my eyes. I couldn't see hardly. And then, uh, uh, I, I walked up to it, which I found out when I got close that it was, my, it was behind it. Um, and I was trying to make out what was going on. And about that time, I heard a bone break, tendon tear, meat rip, or some kind of, you know, crunch or tear. And at that same exact moment in time that I heard that, I noticed I was looking at the back of a wolf head, a very large wolf head that was squatted down, bowed over, and then what I was looking at was the back. It was the back of the thing. It was, it was a big black mass. You couldn't really tell what it was like that. You don't expect to see anything living that big person. Anyway, at the moment I realized what I was looking at, I turned my head to the side to get out of there. I was going to turn and take off. Well, right when I turned, I mean, as I, I'd say not turned because I'd be turned, but I'd say as I was turning, side, this thing looked over its shoulder at me. If I'm looking at it and it's looking away, it looked over its left shoulder at me. It looked over its left shoulder and it had a look on its face like, kind of like I did. Like, oh, look. And it it all happened so fast. It went from oh, to rage, to blown out, ticked off, rage. And you know the, the, the sound uh, like a, a dog would make or a wolf you'd hear on TV or Discovery Channel when if they're eating something and another one comes up there and tries to get it and the one ties into him and snap and growls and rip the kind of attack sound they make. It sounded like that, but magnified. Like, I can't tell you how long. It was loud and it was big and it was deep. And it just, it ripped me. I mean, I could feel it just, it just tore it to me. Um, it's kind of, I'm trying to make sure that I won't miss anything. It's kind of hard to relive through this. Um, but as I turned, this thing did that, and I could see it, it lunged. It lunged, made a lunge motion towards me. And the look on its face was, I got you, ticked off. Nose was wrinkled up. Eyes was squinched down. He had his really long, long pointed ears on top of his head. Really long. He was jet black. His eyes was a like a, a mix of like a yellow little tint of orange like amber color and it wasn't like he was looking right at me it was like he was looking through me he had me I was nothing I was prey and you get that sense of feeling what a a deer would feel like if somebody was hunting it or like being the prey should I say you know like it, it's helpless you, you you got no, you know, no control of the situation anymore. Um, so, uh, um, 
I gotta collect myself here for a second. Sure, take your time. <clears throat> uh. Okay. Anyway, um. Now, as I turn, I turn to run. I take off, and I slip on ice, and I slide. Well, as that happened, I feel pressure on my left arm. I, I mean, I, I mean, I, I feel like a like a frog, almost like a dead leg. Like my like punches you, muscle and it cramps it. Um, and uh, I didn't think much of it. You know, I just felt like, you know, these things running through my head is just racing at this point in time. Anyway, I slid. I hit the front of my truck. My head went down on the hood of my truck. And what went through my head was, it's over. It's done. I waited any second for, it's going to be over. It's done. It's over. You got me. I just waited for that feel. Of teeth sinking into my head, my neck, with clawed hand grabbing to you back of your head, uh, being jerked up, torn to pieces, just kind of just waited any second. I knew it, and just over. My family went to my head of, oh God, you know, what are they going to do now? How are they going to take this? You know, it, it's crazy to think, but anyway, I sat there for a second and realized nothing's happened, so I, I peek back over my shoulder and look, and he's not there, well, I can see that where he was, I can see a big pile of blood on the road, and I see a big drag mark down the hill to the woods, and I seen him. He had this carcass of some kind in his arm, his left arm, and he's heading back to the woods. He's pushing it into the woods. He took his right hand up and he pushed into the woods. Um, his right hand and he just, it was, this dude was huge. I mean, I, I just couldn't believe this was happening. And at the whole time I was, I was thinking, Holy crap, it's a werewolf. You know, that's, it's real. You know, I, how is this happening? And I would say seven foot plus height, four foot wide, shoulders, smaller waist, jet black, coarse hair, not very long, but not real short. I can remember when he lunged at me, I can remember seeing his chest, uh, a chest muscle, uh, like pecs and shoulder muscles, and like, the, I seen the color of his skin, like a blue, blue grayish leather look. Uh, he, uh, he had hands, that looked like hands, he looked like it had like, uh, like a mitt, like a paw on his palm. You know, if that makes sense, like a like a dog paw on the palm of his hand, but fingers long, hard fingers, big black, long claws, but like a like dog's toe pad on the on the, on the, on the bottom. But as he was walking away, I noticed his his uh, legs. He had massive thighs. Number thighs is huge. When it got down to like where a knee would be, it kind of bowed right there. And it looked like he was standing on his toes. And his heels would be really, really high uh, up on the back of his leg. Um, like, kind of like you, you could say like, like a werewolf in a movie, uh, kind of squatted down. Halfway squat, walking on his toes, with really long feet, but his heels would be up on the back of his leg, kind of look. If that makes sense, if I explain that right. Uh, kind of like a dog's leg, he mixed a man's leg with a dog's leg. He had a thigh, but he had that 
lower backward bend in his legs, his toes. He uh he pushed his own way, his way on himself onto the woods, carrying whatever he had with him. And that's when I come back to reality of what crap, what I need to do. I I, I took off, I tried to get my truck, I was sliding around all over the place. I I jumped in my truck, uh, tried taking off, and I was spinning, just sliding all over the ice. And uh, I was freaked out, thinking, holy crap, man, come on, we got to go. I'm scared, you know, get the hell out of here. I need to go. And uh, I couldn't. I remember it was, it was irritating and scary at the same time, but I couldn't get out of there fast enough because I was on this ice, sliding all over the place. Anyway. Get a little ways down the road, and the shock and the, the adrenaline is starting to wear off. And I feel this pulsating little bit of pain in my left arm, and I feel this tickle, like a little like a tickle, something on my elbow, like, like a little weird tickle feeling on the tip of my elbow. And uh, I got, I got stopped. I guess I'm off the pass by now. I got off the mountain pass. I'm on a flat road. Snow is wearing off, and I get, I get so stopped. I look at my arm. I turn my light on inside of my truck, and I realize that the arm of my sweater is shredded. I mean, it's ripped. It's ripped the heck and back. Good. There's four good, distinct rips to the arm, the forearm of my sweater, and I can see blood to there. So I get my sweater pulled off there, and I. My arm is shredded in four spots. I got four shred marks on my arm. Two big ones on the outsides, and then two shorter, smaller ones in the middle. And at the top of the middle claws, he took a chunk with him, like it was like a rip of a chunk of whatever piece of meat of my arm come with it, ripped it off, and then straight, sharp sharp claw marks down the side. On the bottom side of my forearm was bruised pretty bad. It was like I couldn't tell if it was a squeak or, or you know, a thumb or, or a bite. You know, bottom side of the jaw squeezed or what, but it was pretty wide. I know you were saying, I mean, you was talking at night. It was probably too wide to be his mouth, you know. Um, I'm not sure to say how wide his mouth was. It was pretty wide, but not Stick wide. He had a a long muzzle, about five five and a half inches long. Uh, he had sharp fangs, a canine fangs that looked like there was not on the side. It was on the side, but not completely on the side side. It was rolled up more like on a human version of their uh, eye teeth. Um, and he had bottom in the same way. And his teeth in the front and the bottom was sharp and there was on the side back uh, like his uh molars were sharp on the outside edges, like they was folded bent. Like kinda angled inside towards his tongue, towards the center of his mouth, and sharp on the outside and curved up on the inside. Um it's kinda hard to explain that, but I mean it looked like the dude just walked straight out of a horror movie comic book or something you, you know you can see on TV I don't watch much movies at the you know at the time I was growing up and stuff so you know I do know that I've seen some movies that, that this dude look like it, it, it would come out of I mean it was anyway I'll get tied up in the whole mess of that thing I could it, it just or just just freak me out. Anyway, I took out my arm and I'm bleeding pretty bad. I mean, he ripped it pretty good. So I took my shirt on off. I wrap my arm. I get it wrapped up, and um, I actually wrap the shirt I had around my arm, and I had some duct tape. I always kept the side of my seat. I always keep duct tape with me, and wrapped it up. And uh, I had my suitcase with me. I grabbed another shirt. No sweater, put it on. I wasn't gonna tell my wife about it, cause I'm I'm bad about 
I still think there's, you know, a lot of good people left out there. And, I'm, and I'll, you know, see somebody broke down or walking, I'll stop, check on them, help them out, give them a ride, whatever. And my wife always gets on to me about that. You know, she's like, you're going to do that one day and somebody's, you know, going to get into something you ain't going to like or it's going to be a bad situation or bad guy or whatnot. So I was going to tell her I was going to hide it, you know, so you got that put on. Anyway, I can't remember the rest of the way home. It, it's a blur, to tell you the truth. It was. I think my mind was off somewhere else. I couldn't uh, process this thing. Anyway, I got home. I got, uh, you know, I, got, I hit it pretty good. It was, uh, I hit it for a while, about a week. Or I say over five days, 25 days. Nightmares just get bad. I sweat. And then my wife found my shirt. I didn't hit it too good. She, she found a, a sweater that was ripped. The rips and the treads, and uh, I had to tell her what happened. I told her what happened. She didn't doubt me at all. She, you know, she said, "I know there's something out there." You know, but I'm not, I can't say what. But I was sure, you know, there's. Uh, I don't doubt when people say they seen something, and, and, and maybe her husband she didn't doubt me one bit. Um, but she did tear into my butt for stopping and told me that. You know, I better not stop my butt again for nothing like that ever again. But anyway, the sweater I had on was like a thick wool. It was really thick, like a, uh, they call it, uh, I don't know what they call it. I can't remember, but it's really thick, really, really hard, dense, packed sweater. And I was like, man, this thing had to have some razors to rip this, because, I mean, it, it, it was shredded. Well, uh, I'm not lying. I'm not exaggerating at all. When I say we took that sweater and pulled it tight, I took a razor and I swiped at it real hard, pushed it down, ripped it, and I cut into it, and it wouldn't cut through all the way on that first swipe. It took a couple swipes. So whatever it used, whatever it hit me with, was razor sharp. It was sharp enough to cut through the sweater. No problem, all the way through and down a long ways and through me a good bit and take a piece of meat with it. So uh, I'm pretty sure it was a, a hand, a claw that took a swipe at me because, I mean, that was, it was sharp. And you could actually see on the, especially on the outside two swipes, the cuts, there was, it looked like a triangle started like, like an A, like, you know, there's a, the point of them is just one little point, but as they come down, two lines kind of separate, like you was, uh, like kind of an open dog's toenail on the bottom. If you see what I'm saying, like if you look at the bottom of a dog's toenail, how they got an opening in the toenail, a cup, you know what I mean? Like from the point to the back is kind of an A, the A shape, mm-hmm. triangle. No, uh, it was kind of like that on the two outside ones, but they was, close together and it was real sharp, a real sharp, sharp cut. Um, but that's uh, that's pretty much how, how it got to where I, the first person I told, the only person I told besides my wife and my kids and now uh, you. You said your wife gave you a lot of trouble for stopping to try and help someone on the side of the road, but You never did say what her reaction was when you told her what had happened that day, or that night, I should say. How did she react, and what did she say? Well, I'm saying she, um, she didn't doubt me. She gave it a, uh, how do you say it? Took a breath, she looked at me, and she just waited for the punch. She stared at me like a, all right, Billy, uh, come on, give me something here. Uh, this ain't time for jokes, you know, kind of thing. And it kind of embarrassed me, and I kind of felt regret of saying anything. And, you know, uh, 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 
I know I felt myself turn red, I don't know, aggravated, and all, so I, you know, I kind of sat down, and she's like, well, wait a minute, you're serious. I said, yes, ma'am, I'm, 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 I'm dead serious. Yes. And it was an oh my God moment. She, uh, she cried. She, she didn't know how, well, she didn't know what to say. She just, she told me, I didn't know what, I don't know what to say. I, I don't know what to say with something like this. This is something that don't exist and don't happen. And, and you hear about things, but you never think it really be true. And then your, your husband comes home with it. You know, how do you take it? How do you say? What do you say? What prepares you for a moment like that? She kind of put it out there. That's what she. That's what she gave me. That's what she. How she acted. I am glad knowing that you had someone right there that you could share the details of that encounter with. The fact that your wife is always there to bounce things off of and hopefully help you get better. A lot of these people that I talk to, they've got no one to share the details of their experiences with. And as a result, it takes them a lot longer to bounce back to good. So that is, like I told you in the pre-interview, a really good thing there. Now I want to go over some things about that actual encounter. When it turned around and looked at you there, Billy, how close were you to it? And what went through your mind the moment you saw its face? Well, I, I um, thinking about it, I, I, I'm not sure exactly how how close I wasn't I wasn't standing right on top of him I was a couple paces a few paces behind me um but in my mind I'm I'm right he's it's right in my face I'm standing right behind him right on top of him but uh, I was a few paces behind him so I was halfway between my truck and him uh, and I know people would say, well, how didn't he hear you? Oh, bull crap, you can't pull up a mic. Well, you know, it, the snow was, it was blowing pretty hard. The wind was kicking real thick. My truck was silent. And when you're driving on snow, you know, and, and you, you're driving that slow, you could sneak up on something, you know, and the echo in the mountains, I'm guessing. But he was into whatever he was doing. I mean, he was into eating whatever he was into, man. He just like, I, I surprised him just as much as it surprised me. But when um, he kind of turned over and the look at first to me was like, I thought that <laughs> whatever this is, it's going to break and run. He's going to haul butt just like I am because the look on his face and his eye was, uh, what the heck, you know, like I caught him with his pants down, kind of look. Um, eyes was wide, and like he actually caught a breath, like he, <laughs> for a second. But it slipped so fast, it went from, you made a mistake, buddy, uh, kind of look, like you just screwed up. Um, it's over for you. And he turned from, from Oda pissed in zero point zero flat. I mean, the dude was on me. Do you have any idea when those tears happened? Well, I I know when it, I can remember when I felt it. Uh, um, I turned to get out of there. He turns to look at me, and. So as I'm turning my head and I realize he noticed me, I, I kind of stopped from turning to the right, you know. And when then he flipped his switch to mad, I turned to take off. And I'm a good ways away from him by then. I mean, I'm a good hop, skip, and a jump, then a step away and at that moment. And I turned to take off, I mean, hard. And as soon as I turned, I mean, as soon as I turned, Away, my arm is still kind of behind me a little bit to take off. And right at that moment, I feel it. Whop. A punch. So, that dude was able to move, close, get up, close that gap, 
and hit me before I even was had a chance to really take off. So that the listeners know, Billy sent me some pictures of those rips in his arm. I'm going to post those on the YouTube version of the show so you can take a look at them and see for yourself exactly what happened there. And speaking of those pics, Billy, when did you take those photos of your arm? Was it about a week after the fact or what? Yeah, it was about a week and a half after, a week and a half, two weeks after it happened. So it was, it had been healing a while, but it was, it was deep enough to where it, it took them a while. You know, I, I heal really quick. I'm, I, I'm, I eat really good. I'm a natural, you know, like, well, I used to be, but I've always, you know, ate real well. I've always been really healthy, real active, and I've always healed really well and really fast. But, it took that a while to heal, you know, usually a week and a half. A cut, even a cut that was required stitches for me, uh, is closed up good. But a week and a half after that swipe, I'm still, it's still closing up. It don't look that bad, but compared to a week and a half before that moment, it, you know, they look really, really, really good. I know you didn't just let them heal up on their own after you got home or got to wherever you were going. You cleaned them up really good. How deep were those rips in your arm? They were, I can't say them measurements, but they went to the, through the meat. They were, oh, pinky nail deep, probably, almost, by my pinky nail. <laughs> That's pretty deep. They were, uh, I can remember, Cleaning them up, um, I, I took my like my fingernail and was pulling dirt and stuff out of them. I was like scraping inside of them out. So there was about half of my about a pinky nail, three quarters of a pinky nail dip inside of my arm. They were pretty good. I mean, it was in the meat, real good. One thing about that whole chain of events, I just can't figure out is. The bruising that we talked about that was on the underside of your forearm there. It makes me wonder if maybe that was a bite somehow, but if it was, those bottom teeth would have cut into your arm just like the top ones did. So it just doesn't make sense to me where that bruising came from unless maybe its thumb was on the underside and then its four other fingers raked into you somehow on the top. That's the only thing I can come up with. Um... Because it felt like at the time, I'm thinking maybe because my adrenaline was up or what, but uh, it felt like a frog. Not, well, I say frog down where I'm from. I call it a frog, like dead leg. When you get hit, somebody punches you in the muscle and it falls up in a knot and cramps. Um, kind of feels like that, like a pressure. Just like somebody hit me real hard in the arm. Maybe he like, reached out for me to grab me or... Or, or maybe just swung at me. Maybe the bruising just from the impact. I don't know, but the underside of my forearm, the opposite side, was bruised. And it wasn't like a defined spot, like where teeth would maybe be or thumb. But I'm no doctor, so, you know, I'm not sure. I, I, I wish I could have seen, but I don't know what it was. His hand, his mouth, or what. Well, the fact that you didn't feel it when it was happening is totally understandable. I mean, your adrenaline valve had to be cranked wide open at that moment, so that's not surprising that you didn't feel the pain right then. Before you got close to it, was there ever a moment where your intuition told you something wasn't right? Well, I felt that. I felt like, because I just couldn't place what this could be, but it was snowing so hard. The only thing that was going to go through my head was, you know, that car back there on the side of the road. Somebody could be need some serious help. So that kept pushing everything else out of my mind that somebody could be in trouble. Somebody could be in trouble. So I just kept, you know, somebody's under, balled up under a blanket. Uh, two people maybe up under something. Maybe somebody, if a guy boat over on his, on his hands and knees or, you know, what is that? I just couldn't place it. I just, it just, you know, it didn't feel right. It didn't look right. It didn't look right at all because I couldn't place what it was. But the thought of somebody being in trouble kept pushing everything else out of my mind. 
you're an awfully good man. Unfortunately, that benevolence you've got, it puts you in a very unfortunate circumstance, and I really hate to see that. That's not right. How big was this animal that it was eating? Did it look like it was big enough to be, say, a doll sheep, or bigger yet, like an elk, or what? I would say not as big as an elk, no. It was, uh, it was big, maybe deer size. A young mule deer size, you know, good and healthy. It was big, whatever it had, and I couldn't tell if it was part of this thing that he had or all of it, but he could bear over top of it and had it hid. But he was a big dude. Um, but squat down that way, it was like he had his thighs bent, like he was squatting like a person would. Um, Kind of like if he had knees, like they would be in front of him to his chest, and his like his shoulders fold over. Cause I did, like I said, I couldn't see anything other than the top half back of this thing. The snow was deep, you know, built up on sides. So I don't know if he was like partially buried in the snow, bent over on this thing or what. But the only thing I was looking at was like the like the waist back shoulders that spot. So. He was hiding whatever he had completely until he got up and headed to the woods with it under his arm. Changing topics here a little bit here, Billy. Understandably so, you've been having big problems with nightmares after that encounter. Tell us about those nightmares, if you don't mind. Well, every nightmare pretty much that I've had involving this thing is just, I mean, they, at first they was constant. Almost every night, but they would be just a, a black, just staring into black nothing. And then all of a sudden, this thing is in my face. It's in my face, and it's making that loud screeching. Terror. I can't. I don't even know what you would call that. Uh, I have like a screeching, barking roar, you know, like a, like a dinosaur, I don't know, but that, that noise just right in my face, I mean, and, and I would get that feeling again, like, like being prey, uh, like being helpless, like being in an airplane that's going down, like being in the middle of an ocean and a shark, and they grab you by your legs, uh, is the best way I can explain that feeling. And then I'd wake up in a swinging panic. Uh, sometimes I'd wake up flailing, throwing fists, throwing arms, throwing elbows, hollering, you know, running. I could still see it for a while. I could see it in the dark in the corner. And, you know, that making you pray, being from the top of the food chain to <laughs> just stepping down off the food chain. It does to you, you know, you get that. Predators have that, that thing they put off that, uh, sends that bolt of scare to a prey and it makes them run. And when they run, the prey runs. And when the prey runs, they know, okay, that's prey, it's running to go after it, you know, and it, when it does that same thing to you and you feel that feeling it, you know, oh God, it's hard to, just can't put that uh, words to paper of what that that feeling is, but the, the nightmares. You know, I'm talking about actual wake up and then have to change my clothes and my shirt because of my the sweat so bad kind of thing. If it's of any comfort, a lot of people that I've spoken with who have seen these things go through the same kind of thing almost every night. In time, it should get better, especially after our talk. You said you were already feeling better about the situation, but having said that, are the nightmares the worst part of this or what you have to go through during the day? Well, at first it was nightmares. They got better. And like I said, when I told when my wife knew, it got a little better. And once the kids knew, it took another step. And actually, when I said, like I was saying, I felt after, after you, it felt another big step. 
you know, just I could that I can physically feel it lifting. But um but when you're going somewhere, when you want to take your son out hunting or uh walking then now you know, there's that obstacle now, there's that worry then that's taking most of your attention away from what you want it to be on. That is the um that's the I wouldn't say like the you know, toughest but most aggravating thing about it. Now. Yeah, it's not fair when you have something like that happen to you that takes all the fun away. The things that you used to love to do out in the wilds, now you can't do, or you can do, but it's just not the same because now you're worried about running into another one of these things. It's just not right. You said you did some research into this dogman topic, especially about the areas that you go into. Did you wind up ever finding out about any encounters that did happen in the areas that you go into? The areas I go into, um, well, it was up north at the time. I couldn't find anything about anything that looked like a werewolf at the time. There was Bigfoot, you know, encounters and stories everywhere in that north area, but nothing about what I seen. But when I looked closer to my original home where I'm from, down south, I read a lot about encounters, people having them down there. I found out that uh, not far from where I lived, there's a place called Buzzard Roost, Mississippi, where people see these things, and then they call them bush devils. Apparently, everybody that lives out there, it's like a really off the grid, off the map kind of place. It's, it's by, by the river, it's it's nothing but woods. Uh, all right, nobody goes out there, it, and it's a few people live out in the area. But the people that live out there is the kind that live hard. They don't go into town shopping. They don't have electricity. They don't have running water. Nothing like that. So they're, they're really big time country folk that live out in that area, and you don't really think about it. But I found out that out there they see these things that. Not exactly exactly what I've seen, but close. Uh, they call them bush devils. But uh, I found that really interesting. But other than that, nothing where I was. I'm, I'm sure there, may, there had to be something other than me in that area, but I couldn't find anything around that area where I was and where I lived about anybody seeing anything like this. Well, that's really good news. I sure hope that was the first and last encounter you have to ever worry about dealing with. Do you have any closing comments you'd like to share, Billy? Well, I'd like to say, you know, like people out there that, that has had this issue or has seen something like this, I know it's hard on that, you know, thinking about facing the ridicule that there is out there that you're going to receive from this, but trust me, I mean, if it, you share it, it's going, it'll get better. Spit it out to somebody. You know, find somebody to tell. It will do you good. These things are out there. The people that, you know, listen to this and haven't had a counter or, you know, are objective to this kind of thing or whatever, they're there. Just watch yourself because it, it's there. They are. I mean, it's, like the fact, it's a fact. Just like you were saying about you can go down in the uh, rainforest and find a tribe and tell somebody, oh, you know, I drove here in my car. They'd laugh you out of there, you know, with the car. they never seen nothing. they never seen a car. They, they don't even know what that is, you know. But who's the dummy? They are. Cars are real. And, but they don't know that. Just like this. I'm telling you, they are real. It's better to be prepared for it than have a moment like I had and it ruin your day. Then you're weak, then you're here, and then the time you want to spend with your family. So that's that's pretty much all I can say about it. Well, Billy, as I found out really quickly in the pre-interview, this is not an easy subject for you to talk about. I can't thank you enough for agreeing to come on and share the encounter and all the other details with the listeners. I really do appreciate it. I appreciate it, Big. Thank you for that. Thank you for the time and listening and giving me, you know, the opportunity to share my story and, you know, help me with the out. It's 
I, I truly do. I mean, as soon as I get through the story part, the actual event that happened, I feel better. I mean, I, it's like a big weight just pulled right on my chest and just like I can breathe. I got it out there and now. I can't thank you enough for what you're doing. You're giving people a way to get this out, get it off of them, and make people aware of what's, what's out there. Oh, you know you're welcome. And like I told you before, if at any time you think talking about this again would do you some good, please do let me know, because I'll always be here. I'd be glad to help. Well, thanks again so much for coming on, Billy. I hope you have a great night. You too, bud. Thanks for having me. Hey, thank you. We'll see ya. Bye. Bye. If you've had a Dogman encounter and you'd like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, you can reach me at contact at dogmanencounters.com. I'd love to hear from you.